Jessica really doesn't need an introduction. We all know her. We all love her. She's superwoman. She does all this stuff. But something you might not know is that she's a certified, uh, board certified behavioral analyst. And so she's done all this behavior stuff before. She did it professionally and she's done it as a mom. So she has like the double edge of knowledge. And so um, she's going to be talking to us about uh, how to manage some everyday behaviors with Jacobson Syndrome kids. So um, as Lindsay said, my name is Jessica and I, prior to having children, taught children with autism and went on to become a board certified behavior analyst. So then fast forward a few years, um, I got married and had children and my firstborn was diagnosed with Jacobson syndrome. So that is where I am in this. Um, the main thing um, we're going to talk about, we don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm going to go through this as quickly as, can, as I can just to give you like an overview and that way there's time for questions if you have any specific questions about your kids. But I want you to know that, you know, prior to having children, um, I really went by the book when I made recommendations to parents and, you know, looking back, probably was not always all that helpful because I gave them recommendations based on research that would be wonderful to implement in a classroom that just are not realistic to implement at home. So now that I am on the other side of it, I feel that I can be much more realistic in my recommendations to you as parents and I'm also not afraid, you know, when I'm on the other side of that IEP meeting to let them know that is not reasonable, I can't do that. I'm not taking data, I'm not doing this, and you know, the thing is data is the backbone of applied behavior analysis. It's, it's not that I have forgotten that, but it's, it's sometimes unrealistic to expect a parent at home to be able to do the same things that you would be able to do at school. So we're going to try, I just want you guys to understand some of the theories behind this, the method to the madness, so that you understand why certain recommendations are made and, and why we do things a certain way, but then I want to talk about realistic approaches that you can actually, you know, be realistic with at home. So we will get started. So here we go. What is ABA? Applied behavior analysis is the science in which procedures derived from the principles of behavior are systematically applied. So this is a huge definition, but I want to give you like the formal to improve socially significant behavior. That's a really important piece right there because this is a very individual science. We're not talking about what happens for the masses out there. We're, ha we're talking about what happens for your individual child. And, and it has to be to a meaningful degree. So if you make a very slight change in something but it didn't have any impact on your life, was it worth it? It has to be to a meaningful degree. And we want to demonstrate experimentally that the procedures employed were responsible for the improvement of, in behavior. So we are using the principles of behavior, and I'm sure you've heard of B.F. Skinner. He is the, the father of ABA. And we are not going to willy-nilly like just start trying things randomly. We're going to use data to decide how we're going to do things, and then we want to do it in a systematic way. Because if you, for example, start ABA services on Tuesday, and then Tuesday night you start giving Ritalin, how do you know what was responsible for the change in behavior? You don't. So you want to try things one at a time, and the data are helpful because you will see whether or not there is a change in the behavior. Sometimes, you know, your feeling is not accurate, but if you actually are plotting how many times your child hit his head that day, and, and you plot it, you can actually see that there's a difference versus what you may feel is happening. And, and other times, we might um, change our definition, if you will, of, of what is bothering us. Like, we might initially say, okay, you know, we really cannot have um, the child, uh, my son, you know, hitting his head. And then the behavior might get a little bit better. Maybe he's just doing this, but now it's just annoying to me. And so I'm still considering that hitting his head. Well, actually... He used to actually hurt himself, and now he's doing this. I would say that's pretty impressive that we've gotten to that point. So we need to be careful that we don't shift the definition as time goes on. 
we want to make sure that we're actually measuring what we started out measuring. And if there's a change, that's fine. Okay, now we no longer want them doing this because it doesn't look appropriate in the, when we're out in the community. Okay, that's fine, but now we're, this is something different now. This is a new thing that we're working on. Okay, and the next thing is that there are decades of research to back up ABA. There are so many things out there nowadays that, that you know, when you Google how, you know, behaviors or something that will come up. And I am not saying that certain things might work. You know, for certain kids, it's actually proven that taking away um, dyes or gluten or, or casein or certain things actually do help them. The data show that these children had an actual allergy or intolerance to those things. But for many other families, they're just trying things willy-nilly because they're desperate and they're grasping at straws. And some of these things are not backed up by research. So I just want you to be mindful um, of what you're trying out there and that ABA is backed up by decades of research. It is effective when used properly. And I want you to be knowledgeable about that. You know, feel free to try whatever you want to try out there, but look into it first, you know, and, and make sure that it, it, it has something behind it before you just jump in. Um, okay, so in ABA, as we said in the definition, the goal is to bring about meaningful and positive change in behavior. And together, we're going to work on how we can do that today. So with the behavioral approach, um, all behaviors are learned, which means that they can also be unlearned. And our goal is to increase appropriate behaviors and decrease inappropriate behaviors. So that sounds really easy, right? Why do people engage in inappropriate behaviors? Well, there are many reasons, but behavior is maintained by consequences. And I think we often fixate on what the behavior is instead of thinking about why the behavior is happening. Um, for example, you know, you might say, oh, my child, you know, is, is throwing up or my child is running away from me or, you know, he is aggressive toward his sister. And really, the actual behavior doesn't matter. What, beha what matters with the behavior is what is maintaining that behavior because that is what we need to address. That is how we're going to stop these negative behaviors. And we have the sequence of antecedent behavior and consequence. So what is happening this is why we take the data. Before the behavior occurs, what is the behavior and what is happening after, directly after? And that is how we figure out what is maintaining this behavior. So I hope that um, by the end of this, you will be able to stop defining behaviors in terms of topography so that's what they look like. Instead, we want to think of behavior as a form of communication. So I think we can all agree that regardless of where our children fall on the spectrum of Jacobson syndrome, they are all deficient in their communication skills. You know, some of our children may speak verbally, some may speak with signs or with pecs, some may have no way to communicate. That is where behaviors come in. That serves as their form of communication to us. That is their way to let us know they don't like something. It is their way to let us know that they do like something. It's their way to let us know that they want to escape a situation. Um, that they want something, or maybe just that they like how something feels. So it's really important that we kind of let go of what the actual behavior is and instead think about what is he trying to tell me when he does this? He doesn't have the words to tell me it's too loud in here. So instead, maybe they're going like covering their ears and yelling at, at the top of their lungs, okay? And to us, we see that as, oh my God, everyone's staring at me. You know, what am I going to do? We need to stop this behavior. Instead of thinking, why is he engaging in this behavior? So what our goal is, we need to figure out why they're engaging in the behavior, and then we need to give them an appropriate response that will serve the same function as that behavior. So instead, maybe we can teach our son or daughter to say, it's too loud in here. I need to leave. Or we can have them, if they use pecs, to hand you something that says too loud. Or if they use signs, to have them sign too loud. Maybe we can, as an antecedent, give them headphones that will help block out some of the noise, if, if that's the issue that they have. We, we want to 
address behaviors before they happen. So if we know that loud situations are hard, address it before you get into the loud situation. Don't wait until you get there. You want to address it before. And, and that would be, you know, with, with any behavior, but that's just the example um, I'm giving you in this moment. So next we have the functions of behavior. So these are the four main categories of why behavior happens. We have attention. And I always put this one first because in my life, this is, this is the reason we engage in our behaviors in my house. And um, it's essentially, if, if you have my son out one-to-one, -one, he's a joy. He has all of your attention. You're doing exactly what he wants to do. And, and things are smooth and fun. The moment we add the two brothers into the situation, things get out of control rapidly. <laughs> and um, he will tell me, I like to be alone with you. He is verbal, and I am lucky that he is able to tell me that. And so I will say back to him, I, I like to be alone with you too, but today we're not alone. Today we're all here together, and you have to share my attention. That's not enough for him, though. He still wants all of the attention, so you will see the behaviors come out because he wants the attention and he's not getting it. And so, you know, he will run away, he will, you know, do many inappropriate things just to get that attention because he's not getting the one-on-one -on -one while his brothers are there. Same thing would happen at school, and, and so think about your children, you know, what kind of a classroom they're in. My son is lucky in that he is in a classroom of six kids, and he does get a lot of attention. But every single time a child in his classroom has a birthday, I get a note that he had a hard day. It's no longer a surprise. I'm kind of always anticipating it now because another child is the center of attention on that day, and he can't stand it. And he, will, he even has the words to say, I'm jealous. You know, um, Patrick is getting all the attention today because it's his birthday. He got a special toy from the, the receptionist at school, and everyone sang to him, and where's my attention? He'll actually say it. But you know what? It doesn't prevent him from having the behaviors because that is his go-to response when he's not getting attention. And so we need to make it easy for him to have a response. He's able to actually identify. So we're we're up here that he can identify when he's having a hard time, but he still goes to his immediate go-to, which is to have a behavior to get the attention, rather than to say, hey, can I have a special song today, or can I have, you know, a special prize? He's still not able to do that. So that is our job, to teach him a way to request the attention appropriately. And it's, it's harder than it sounds, but it takes a lot of work. But if we can teach him this replacement skill, of asking for attention appropriately, we can help decrease the behavior when he's not getting attention at school. The next function would be escape or avoidance. And um, this one can describe me. And I have a vomit phobia. I put that out there for everyone because if it happens, I'm out. So don't worry about that. You won't, you, you won't see my, uh, my, my shadow. But basically, if something happens and your child just can't handle it if it's too loud and they bolt when that happens or in a crowd if it's just too much like sensory wise for them. Um, if you're asking them to do math work and math is too hard for them, they will engage in behaviors to avoid this situation. And the same thing happened with my son. He was engaging in behaviors every day during math. This was when we were in the public school. And so every day I was getting the same note. Peter was on the floor, Peter was running out of the room, he was doing this, you know, it was like the same thing every day. And we switched him out of that school and they started teaching him math in a different way. The behavior stopped immediately because he understood it the way they taught it. So there are going to be times when your child doesn't want to do something and they will engage in a behavior to get out of that situation, even if it's just a delay for 20 minutes. When you serve them vegetables at dinner, and they don't want to eat them. So instead, they're lying on their chair, they're jumping out, they're reading a book, they're trying to escape eating those vegetables. If you serve them, you know, with the donut, chances are you're not going to see those behaviors because they want to eat the donut, except my son, he doesn't. But um, the next thing could be access to a desired item or activity. So if there's something that they want and they don't have a way to tell you that they want that or the easiest thing is to just go and hit their brother to get that activity, that's what they're going to do because it's easy. 
And I think the same thing exists for us. If there was a pill that would give me like that, like a, a model body, you'd better believe I would take it rather than, you know, engaging in two hours of exercise every morning. You know, I'm, I'm always seeing on Facebook, I'm not going to, I don't want to pick on you, but Yasmin's out there running. And I'm like, oh God, I should get out there and run. But when the alarm goes off in the morning, I'll be honest with you, I don't want to get up at that, you know, before everybody has to get up. So for me right now, the easy way out is just not to do anything. But if the pill existed, I would take it because it's easier. So think about that with our kids. They're going to go to the easiest. They're not going to say, well, you know, if I use my words, I'm going to get this. In the moment, they can't think about that. They think about the easiest thing. So I want that item. I'm not going to ask my brother for it. I'm just going to go take it or I'm going to hit him, grab it and run. And that's, you know, <laughs> in their mind right now, that's what makes sense. So we need to teach them, you know what? Right now your brother has this, so you can ask him for it. And we help make that an easier response for them than the initial just hit and run. We want to teach them that there are alternatives to the behaviors they're engaging in that will get them what they want. Because that's ultimately the end goal. They want something. And they think this is the direct way to it. So we have to teach them, when you hit your brother, you're not going to get this item. And you need to, to actually enforce that. You need to take it away and not let them have it. And then you practice asking for it. If that's handing a text picture over, saying, you know, my turn or toy, then that's what you do. If you're teaching them to sign, I want, or I'm not actually sure what the sign is, but you want to give them an appropriate response that will replace the negative behavior. And then you want to reward them for that. So initially, and this might be hard for brothers to understand, but initially, if they go up to them and ask for it, you want to give it to them right away so they understand using appropriate communication will get you what you want. Once they understand that, that's when you start delaying and say, okay, brother's playing with it. You can have it in five minutes. Or, you know what, not right now. That's not a good time. But initially, you want to reinforce them every single time they ask for it because we want to teach them when you use appropriate words or text pictures or signs, you get what you want versus when you engage in inappropriate behavior, you don't get what you want. You really want to make that clear for the kids. Consistency is so important, and I understand as a mom how hard that is. There are times when I'll be honest with you, I just don't want to deal with it. I just, can't, Richie, can't you just give him the toy? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do this. And really, though, you do have to do it. You have to be consistent if you want the results. So it's really important that your child understands when I engage in these negative behaviors, no one's giving me anything. But when I engage in the positive behaviors, that's when I'm going to get it. And then the last one is sensory feedback. And that could be just that they like the way something feels, so they're engaging in it. And it, it could be um, an example I'll always use. When I'm sitting down listening to like a speaker, for example, I have my legs crossed and often my leg will just kind of move you know, and uh, kick it. And I don't even realize I'm doing that. And sometimes then I'll realize it and I stop. It's just something that my body kind of automatically does, I guess, when I'm sitting still for a little while or, you know, you might like tap your fingers down. And so we, we also need to be careful about which behaviors we are intervening with. Just because it might be a little annoying to you doesn't mean we need to intervene. You need to think about it in terms of the functioning for your child. And if it's actually negatively impacting their life or someone else's life, that's when we intervene. If it's just something, if you're annoyed when he's tapping, really ethically, I don't feel like that's something that you want to intervene with. That's, you know, maybe you can try to distract them with something like, hey, you know, do you want this fidget toy or do you want to squeeze this, you know, um, this medical ball or something? But, um, which brings me to something I forgot to mention before. Um, ethically, as a behavior analyst, we need to rule out medical issues before we intervene in something. Because there are times when, um, for example, bedwetting, that we might treat it as a behavior, but there actually might be a medical reason that it's happening. So you want to rule out medical issues prior to treating behaviorally, just in case there's something going on that your child can't help. You know, you want to make sure that you rule that out first. Um, okay, next. The function of behavior is not always obvious. And that's where the data come in. So I, again, I do understand as a parent that sometimes you're just, I can't do the data. And, and if you're lucky enough to have a behavior, behavior analyst like in your school district or working with you through insurance, you have to be honest with them. Because I will tell you as a professional coming in, I want to help you. 
I don't want to make your life harder. And so if there is a way that you could take data, say if you only had to circle responses rather than write them in, or maybe if you only did it for 20 minutes a day instead of two hours, be honest, because I would rather you tell me, listen, this is all I've got, this is all I can do, than have you yes me while I'm there, and then I come back two weeks later and there's nothing. <laughs> you know, then I feel like I failed you. What can I do to actually help you succeed in taking the data? So you have to be honest with the providers who are helping and let them know what you actually can do and, and, and what is too much for you. Um, and we've already said behavior analysts take data to determine the function. So um, if you're having severe behaviors at school, for example, you really want to request a functional analysis because that is a situation where the behavior analyst will come in and manipulate situations to find out why your child is engaging in the behavior. You really need to know why so you know how to tackle it because sometimes, you know, kids might engage in a behavior where they're doing this and we think, oh, they just like how it feels when actually that might be when they get lots of attention, when the teacher keeps coming over, put your hands down, put your hands down, Johnny, put your hands down. And, and that actually might be an attention motivated behavior because, or, or maybe he's doing it because whenever he does this, they say, oh, he needs a break, and they put him in the corner. Guess what? He just got out of math, and so maybe it's an escape behavior. So things that might look a certain way might actually be related to something else. So sometimes the data really are important to determine those things, you know. Okay, next. Once you determine why your child is engaging in the undesired behavior, then coming up with an effective consequence is possible. So we touched on this a little. But with an attention-seeking behavior, you want to remove attention and teach them how to ask for it. So in, in many situations, this isn't possible. But at home, one way to remove attention would just be to get up and leave the room. And you know, things like eye contact actually could be attention to your child, something really subtle like that. So you have to be really careful about any level of attention you're giving them if you think that their behaviors are attention maintained. The next would be for escape or avoidance behavior, you want to prompt through that activity and teach them how to ask for a break. Because sometimes all they need is a little break and then they can get back to the activity. But you want to teach them how to say, like, you know, I, I just, I need a minute. Like, can I please have a minute? Let them have a minute and then come back and, and work on it again. Um, access to a desired item or activity, you want to deny access and then teach them how to ask for that appropriately. And sensory feedback or automatic reinforcement, we want to teach an appropriate time or place to engage in a behavior. So there are times when your child might engage in an inappropriate behavior. Um, one thing that, you know, having sons that would come to mind would be, um, say, putting a hand down the pants. That is not appropriate when we're at Target or when we're, you know, at my parents' house. But you know what? If we're home, go in your room, and then that's appropriate. You can do that when you're in your room. You cannot do that out here. So sometimes it's just teaching the difference between where something is appropriate and where it isn't. Because if you, for that particular example, which Sora will go into later, um, if you never allow them the opportunity to engage in certain behaviors, that's when you're really going to have a problem because they may need that outlet and you're not giving it to them. So let's teach them where it's appropriate. And even if it's something, um, like before we talked about some behaviors that might be a little bit annoying to you, like some kind of a self-stimulatory behavior, you might teach them, you know what, when you go in the playroom, you can do that. But when we're at the table, we're going to keep our hands down. So you can teach them to excuse themselves from the table if they feel that they need a minute to engage in their behavior and go in the playroom or go in their bedroom and then come back. And again, eventually you fade these out where you say, okay, when dinner's finished, that's when you can go to the playroom. But initially we want to teach them immediately when they're asking for something to let them have it so they're using words, language, sign language, pex pictures as their first line of defense rather than having the behavior. Okay, so what is reinforcement? A lot of people mix up reinforcement and rewards. And um, you will hear them say, oh, but I gave them, you know, reinforcement. It's only reinforcement if it increases the likelihood that that behavior will happen again. Um, one of the examples um, I like to give would be um, that I love to eat chocolate. So if you offer me a piece of chocolate and say, okay, you know, would you like to... Um, you know, do this math sheet and then I'll give you a piece of chocolate. 
Chances are, if the math sheet isn't too hard, I'll sit down and do it to get the piece of chocolate. But if I just had a huge dinner and dessert and I'm not hungry, it doesn't matter how many pieces of chocolate you offer me. That's not motivating for me right now because I don't want it. So we have to look at motivation. And in the moment, if they are not motivated to earn something, it's not a reinforcer. You're basically just throwing things at them to try to get them to engage in a behavior. You want to make sure that it's something in the moment that is rewarding to them. And there are ways to manipulate this. So if, for example, you would like to teach your child how to ask for a drink, you want them to be thirsty. That is a natural situation where they would ask for a drink. So feed them some potato chips, which are salty, and then chances are in a minute, they will, it, they will be more apt to ask for a drink. Um, if you are working on trying to get them to eat new foods, don't give them any snacks that day. You know, give them their breakfast and then nothing until lunchtime when you're going to work on introducing new foods because I think, you know, we can all agree, all they need is like a, gold, a piece of goldfish or a graham cracker and they're good. You know, they, I don't know how they survive sometimes, but if, if you're giving them a food that they don't want and they've had just a little something, it's enough and they'll, they'll refuse it. So you need to make sure they're hungry if you're going to work on eating new foods. You know, if you want to work on um, increasing language, the best thing to do is to pick items or activities that they like. So rather than pick words that are important to you for them to learn when you're introducing language, pick things that are important to them. You know, I remember Petey, when he was little, loved bubbles. So that was one of his first words. I mean, is that what I wanted for his first word? No, I wanted like mom. But, you know, that wasn't it. He wanted the bubbles. So we taught him bubbles. And, you know, he loved music. So we worked on music. And we really went with his motivation. And once he started to learn, he, he learned with signs initially. Once he started to learn that when he would sign, this is, I don't remember if this was what we made up or if it's actually officially the sign. But once he learned this for bubbles, he learned this for music, and once we kept going, and he was motivated by food initially, eat, then he realized, oh, when I sign this, I get what I want, so I don't have to scream on the floor, because when I do this, like I would jump through hoops when he would sign something to make sure that he got what he wanted initially, so that he learned, every time I do this, mommy plays music. Every time she does, I do this, mommy blows bubbles. Every time I do this, mommy gives me something to eat. And he was starting to make that contingency. And I also never gave him anything for free. And it was hard. It's very hard because as a mom, you just want to, you don't want your child to, to basically go through anything hard. You want to make things easy for them. But it's kind of the opposite. You have to take a step back, make it hard now, so that way they have the language later. And I wouldn't give him a thing without asking for it. And even if I had to prompt the sign, I would prompt him to sign bubbles. Like I would hold the bubbles and I would play with them and I know he wanted them. And if he couldn't independently sign bubbles, I would sign it for him and then give it to him. If he wanted to turn the light on, which he was always obsessed with lights, I wouldn't do it until he, I forgot which sign we made up, but we made up a sign for light. So the moment he would sign that, I would turn the lights on. And then a few minutes later, I'd go turn them off again and I would practice it again. And so it's constant. You're actually a teacher at home. You're, you're not just a mom. And that sometimes can be hard, I think, for us, that sometimes you just want to be mom or dad. Um, but you have to be teacher as well. And it, it, it's not an easy role. I definitely appreciate that. But the harder you make it for them now and you make them use their words to get anything in their environment, the easier it will be later because they will understand that language has a function and that it gets them what they want. And again, it doesn't have to be spoken language. It can be signs. It can be pecs. The, some kids are using iPads now. So whatever way your child can communicate, you need to give them a voice. If they have no voice, of course they're going to have behaviors. I mean, think about, you know, if you go to a foreign country and you don't speak the language and you need the bathroom, what are you going to do if you can't express to somebody you need the bathroom? I mean, I think I'd have a meltdown too, right? All I want to do is tell you that I need the bathroom. No one in this country, it's like Greek, nobody understands me, and what am I going to do? So that's how our children feel every day when they don't have a way to tell us something. How frustrating must that be? And yes, it's hard for us to deal with the behaviors and to sort through everything and to figure out what, what they want, 
but how would you feel if on the inside you knew what you wanted and you couldn't get it out to anyone? So we really need to work on giving them that voice and teaching them how to ask for what they want. And that language is the way to do it. The negative behaviors are not the way to do it. And we want to teach that contingency as early as possible. It's, it's never too late. You can always work on behaviors. But the earlier you start, the, the quicker I think that our children will understand it. But it's never too late. There's always hope. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, so how are the effectiveness of reinforcers changed? So we talked about this a little bit. What's driving the reinforcers? What, what is it that's making them want certain things? You can manipulate this. And deprivation versus satiation is really an important thing for you to consider as well. So I have used the iPad to keep my son busy. I, I admit it right here in front of you. There are times when I've let him have it longer than I wanted him to have it initially because he's quiet and he's not bugging me and he's not bugging his brothers. That being said, if he has unlimited access to the iPad, is that going to serve as an effective reinforcer later when I need him to be quiet? No, because he has satiated on it. I have let him have it for an hour and now when I say, oh, you need to eat that broccoli or you're not getting your iPad, he's going to say, I already had an hour of iPad. <laughs> I don't need it. I'm good. I'm not eating the broccoli. So I have nothing to hold over his head. Whereas if I deprive him of the things he likes and make him earn those things, I have power again. And it's really hard. But you have to think of it, of it like maybe like filling up a gas tank. If your gas tank is full, you can't put any more gas in there. So if you allow them access to something and they've filled up on it, you can't use it anymore. So be um, just cognizant of that. And when you're trying to teach a new skill, for example, um, potty training is something that always comes to mind. You want to pick a reward that they will only get when they're potty training. Because if they have access, let's just say it's ice cream. If they have access to ice cream every night for dinner, and now you're trying to say, okay, if you pee on the toilet, you're gonna have ice cream, they're thinking, I'll just hold out till after dinner, that's easier, no thanks, you know. You want to pick rewards that you can actually keep away from them so that it's more effective. And it's really important also if, if they're getting rewards at school that you're in communication with their teachers because, you know, if, if my son's getting iPad access at school for his rewards and I think I'm holding it over his head at home, my son is verbal enough to say to me, I already had it at school. And I think he likes to to say that to me as well, to say like, no, I'm in control, you're not in control, let's be honest. So we want to do this across environments, and that's why it's really important to communicate with your child's teachers or caregivers, babysitters, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whoever is involved. If there are certain things you don't want them to have because you're using it as a reward for a behavior at home, they cannot use it. It's really important. And if they can't do that, then maybe it's time to pick another thing that you actually can restrict because if their gas tank is full, it's not going to work. Um, okay, and then lastly, um, I think it's also really important that you establish rules because if you don't have the rules established, our, our children might not understand what we want from them. And you might think, oh, it's so clear, like this has always been the rule, but it might not be clear to him or her. And in the same way that if I didn't have any slides up there and I just said these five things out loud, would you be able to repeat them all? Probably not, but they're here. So now you can read them to yourself, you can say them out loud, you know, I can say them so you'll hear them, you can write them down. There are different ways that you can learn them and we wanna do the same things for our kids. So one way to do that, you know, is in the kitchen, you might put up a rule card that says, you know, when we are eating, we use a fork if that's important to you or, you know, that we, um, we ask nicely for, you know, mommy to pass the ketchup or whatever the rule is that is important to you. It's helpful to give them a visual. And if they can't read, then you would use picture cards. And, you know, you could have a picture um, of a child like raising their hand or a picture of something, wh whichever way your child communicates, that's what you want to use. Um, I didn't write a slide for it, but another helpful thing would be to teach the children using a picture activity schedule. And one really um, like great idea that I heard from another presenter last year is that there are some things that we don't need to fade. We worry about them being independent, 
But if your child can take a shower independently, as long as there are pictures in the shower that show a picture of shampoo, a picture of body wash, a picture of rinsing, a picture of drying, and that is enough to help your child, okay, check off, I did this part, I did this part. We don't need to fade that. Who's with them in the shower? No one. But who cares if they have a prompt up there? We want to think about this, about the things that are important. And, you know, tying shoes was always something I wanted our son to learn. And finally, one day, he was having many behaviors. It was hard for him, fine motor is really hard. Why are we doing this? When we can get sneakers nowadays that look like they have laces, they're the, like the toggle kind of shoe, who cares? Or he can wear loafers, or he can wear Crocs. But you know what? Is that really the most important thing? No. So we need to look at it sometimes. We might have a goal, but if it's not working out, maybe step back. Maybe in another year we can work on that, or maybe it's just not that important. Maybe it's okay if he always has support through the use of a picture or schedule in the shower or, you know, in, in, in any, any environment. So um, that is it. Oh, well, the guidelines would be state the rules positively, keep the rules simple, keep them developmentally appropriate, keeping in mind, you know, not only how old your child is, but where they are functioning. You want to actually make sure you teach them the rules and then you want to communicate with other people who care for your child and make sure that the rules are common across the settings so that it's always clear. So that is it. And if you have questions, Janet and I will both be answering um, questions at this point. Thank you. So if anyone has any questions, you can come up. If not, you can speak to one of us after. That would be fine. Um, this might be a more complicated question, but how can you apply this to hitting? So our biggest undesired behavior is hitting her little sister, and we've been working on techniques for over a year and a half. Um, and it's anywhere from five to 20 times a day, depending on, and it's, it can be pretty violent. Thoughts. <laughs> Just, just the kind of, um, and it's at the point where we, we tried just ignoring it altogether. Depends on our level of resilience ourselves, how much we've slept, and we're really inconsistent with giving attention to it. And at this point, we just react, you know, stop, we move away. And it's just, it's a really difficult, it's a really difficult one when the safety of one child is in jeopardy. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so... Kind of going off of what Jessica was describing for behaviors, what uh, we need to know why, right? Looking at the behavior, but why is the hitting occurring? And we can look at it in terms of. I think you have a great. Can, can, you go can I use you your slide? Go for it. <laughs> uh, if we look at here, why is your child hitting? And so, is there, you know, from an OT perspective, is or even OT behaviors, oh. what are they trying? What is your child trying to communicate? through the hitting, and uh, looking from a sensory perspective, is it related to a sensory processing problem? Maybe, maybe not. And what happens, what I didn't go into, uh, I could uh, talk for many, many, many hours about sensory processing, <laughs> but what I didn't go into is that often, uh, if the sensory systems aren't integrating information accurately, or if children are more aversive to sensory input than, uh, abil than tolerant of the sensory input, what happens very, very quickly is the children, like I said before, they're very smart and they adapt. And they, they, how they adapt is they create these behaviors. They create the hitting. Like, for example, if I don't like to, I say I don't like touch, right? So if I don't like the touch sensation, I will quickly learn that people won't touch me if I start hitting them, right? And that's a common referral that we get is for children to have aggressive behaviors. And so we have to figure out why, right? And so sometimes if someone's sensitive, right? if I hit Jessica, I don't want her this close to me, I hit her, she's not going to come close to me again, right? And then it starts impacting her, my social interactions, right? I get labeled being aggressive, et cetera, but that's from a sensory perspective is why is that? Or communication-wise, is it, uh, does she have the language to ask for something, or does she have the ability to ask for something but with the right timing? So I look at the communication. I work really closely with speech um, and language pathologists as well for that communication piece 
Did I miss it as an OT that they have the language so they should be able to ask, but maybe it's a timing factor. They can't ask quick enough, so it's much easier just to hit, get you out of my way, and take what I want. But that's kind of thoughts what I look at for behavior. So it really is a lot of investigative work to figure out why is the behavior happening in the first place to try to eliminate it. Because if we just try to eliminate the behavior without knowing the why, it, it stays. It's really hard to take it away. So, well, let, let me, one more thing, though, I will say. Um, it's also important that as the sibling, you're honoring them, that they yes. shouldn't be getting hurt. And, you know, I know obviously you care about this, and that's why you're asking. I would say the best thing to do in that situation is not to say anything, but just remove the sibling and just go in a different room so that the sibling feels that you care about what just happened to them and you're not giving attention. It, it, it is really hard. I, I will admit at the same thing at home. I mean, I am not consistent with behaviors all the time. And so then when you see him engaging in a behavior, you yell at him one time, you send him to his room another time, you remove you know, the sibling another time. It's not clear. So you have to both get on board with what you're going to do. And it always has to be the same. And that you see if it's effective. And if it's not, then you would try something else. I mean, ideally, you would be able to take data or have someone observe why this is happening, but if you can't, and you think he's doing it because he likes when she has the iPad, he hits her, or if you know um, she has a snack and he wants it and he's hitting her, or she's too close to him and he needs his personal space, then you want to start teaching him to say that, you know, you're too close to me. Can I have a snack? Is it my turn on the iPad? But ultimately, you want to make the sibling feel safe too and remove from the situation so that she feels or he valued and, you know, that you're, you're addressing it. I think one more thing just with that too is making sure also once you decide on what the action is going to be after you see that behavior, it's so important we work closely at our clinic with the behavioral therapists too because we want to have the same reaction from everybody. So not just parents at home, but teachers, <laughs> therapists too. So we need to be on the same page in terms of behavioral plans so that we don't provide the wrong reinforcement for behaviors. Right. Um, yeah, that's the point of the behavioral plan. It's, it's written out so that anyone could walk in, read it, and follow it. Yeah. And if that's not possible, then you need a better plan. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a way to judge the plan as a parent at you know, an IEP meeting or when you're given this plan. If you couldn't read the plan and follow it, then it's not, it's not good enough. You need something better. Okay. So then my second question based on your answer is um, how can you get at what is behind the behavior. We've been trying to do this for a year and a half, and haven't. She's very verbal. She's um, pretty high functioning. She um, doesn't seem to have any cognitive delays. She does have speech impairment, and she does love to hug. And she really wants access to Molly. She loves to hug her, mm -hmm. and a lot of the times we feel like that's what starts it all. But we can't. We knowing all of that, we cannot get behind why like what we can't get behind it specifically enough to make a plan and I don't even know at this point who can I go to to help me with this investigation like what kind of um therapist does it only happen or at clinic home? is it only something that happens with her sibling it's, it's only something that happens with the sibling sometimes with her teachers and with us but it's much more common with her sibling and okay. I, it's, it's beyond sibling rivalry, it's like, right. or jealousy. It's, it's I like, think it's, that's an and important it's, thing it's really, to I really think it's access and love toward her, but I can't figure out like the next step. Um, and nobody seems, they're like, oh, that's really lovely, but nobody seems to right. be able to get us to I the next step. I would be less step. inclined to think it's sensory based if it's only happening with one person. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas if it happened with everybody, it would be easy to say, mm, there's a sensory input, you mm -hmm. know, issue going on here. But if it's one person that it mainly is happening with, I think, and it would make sense that your reaction is probably really big when it's a sister. And I know, you know, my son's 70 pounds and his younger brother is a, about half that. And so when he does something to his younger brother, he does get a reaction, even though I know better, because you don't want him to hurt the sibling. So that, there is probably a strong attention component and you maybe want to teach her how to ask for more attention from you. It might actually be trying to get your attention, but she realizes that this is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. So something. Yeah, else. that's true. Thanks. Yeah. <coughs> with just a quick follow-up with that too is what um, what Jessica was saying is 
for sensory processing problems and sensory integration problems, we're looking for patterns and behaviors. And so that's a pattern of behavior, but specific, again, to one person. So it's different than if this behavior is observed with the world, right, that she interacts with, uh, or he, sorry. What's that? Son or daughter? Daughter, daughter, so yeah. with, that she interacts with. So, um, but yes, I would look at that, and maybe does she, does she have a speech therapist involved? She does, yeah. We're, we just started in a new district, so we okay. don't know who it is yet, or, but. I just, I, I wonder with, if they can look at also her auditory processing for timing. Her what? The auditory processing oh, for timing oh. of her understanding of language, mm -hmm. too, because some of our children process language slower, and so even with verbal prompting or requesting that it just, it might be a lag time in that communication process. So she might have the skill set to ask for your attention or something, but the timing of it might be off too. Yeah, that sounds like it could be right. So yeah. mention it yeah. to all of the team members yes. and get help mm -hmm. because it, you can't tackle everything on your own. You need help. And I don't know if your new district might have... Um, the option of having in-home support. Some districts do, some districts don't, but it's certainly something you can ask for in the IEP. And there are districts that send behaviors to the home to help figure out what's going on, and, and that could be helpful to you. We need help, thank you. Yes. Um, we have a question on the stream. Uh, Marie asks, Hi, would... Marie. A <laughs> Uh, thank you. Marie says, would an oral aversion be considered a tactile issue? Dylan has a super strong gag reflex and is orally aversive to strong taste, smells, and textures, and will throw up if it's too much for him. Yes, it often is related to <laughs> a sensory aversion. And so it's, it's, I'm looking at this man, but I'm talking to Marie. So <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know where to look. It's a very odd social <laughs> phenomenon. You, you, uh, you can yes, look into the be, camera. Uh, the camera? There, oh, there. Hi, Marie. Uh, so, yes, it could be a sensory aversion uh, to tactile and olfactory systems, uh, telling the nervous system that that smell and that taste is aversive to your body, triggering that gag reflex. And so um, I would talk to an occupational therapist about that, um, especially if it's impacting your child's nutritional intake. I agree with that, and I would also further say, um, look at the reactions that mm -hmm. Dylan gets when he vomits. Mm -hmm. I imagine if, if, if I were present, you know, and I'm like, ah, I'd run out. <laughs> so that might be, okay, great. Now I don't have to eat the food I don't like. Mm -hmm. I'm capable of eating this food, but I'd really rather hold out and get the french fries. Mm -hmm. So if Dylan's like Pete, that could also be what's happening. And, and there are certain textures that maybe people prefer and, and, and don't prefer, but that they are still capable of eating. And maybe just in a much smaller quantity maybe would be one way to introduce it. Um, and like we said before, not allowing snacks if you're introducing new foods. Wait until it's meal time, and then you know introduce a very, very small amount. Um, the research has actually shown with feeding therapy that it's not enough to look at a food, touch a food, lick a food. You actually need to ingest a food for it to make a difference. The food could be the size of a grain of rice, but you actually need to ingest it. And it could be up to about 20 times for young children to try a new food before they will accept it readily. So that's a lot of perseverance on the part of a parent. But if you persevere, I believe you could make a difference. So, you know, I mean, there are sensory wise. I remember as a child, I wouldn't eat chicken pot pie. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the mixed <laughs> texture that, that came with that. But I, I like it now. So some things they could outgrow. But it, it, you want to look at the reaction also, Marie, that he's getting mm -hmm. in this situation because that could be playing into right. it as well. Right. And then the 20 time, introducing new foods 20 times, that's for typically developing children. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So just typically developing children reject new foods. So that just happens in everyday life. So it's important to introduce, reintroduce, and also not react to, like if a child uh, doesn't like a new food, you go, oh, is it bad? Did it taste yucky? Do you not like it? And you're making this face. You're giving reinforcement for the child to not like that food right. as well. And that you need to also, when we talked about our own sensory preferences, you have your own food preferences. And so I know there's certain foods I don't like. And so I have to make sure if one of my clients is working on eating that food, 
I can't make a face of, oh my gosh, why are you eating this, right? <laughs> because I'm going to get reinforced, don't like this food. So it's really important. And then again, looking at the patterns, not everybody has to eat every piece of food, every type of food, every texture. It, what you're focusing on is function, or function and nutritional intake. And so I know I always just use my example because I have my own issues. Just I told you before, I have tactile sensitivities. So, and I have a Japanese background. And so growing up, my mom would, she would tell me very clearly, she paid lots of money to, <laughs> to pay for that special cut of fish to serve as sashimi. Sashimi is that raw fish texture. If you can picture it, if you like it, if you like it, wonderful. I hated it, would <laughs> gag, and my mom was just horrified that this, her child was not eating this wonderful piece of fish that she paid so much money for, and she served it all the time, but I just wouldn't eat it. And so I'd make her cook it, which also horrified her, and I would eat it that way, but I would not eat sashimi, okay? Uh, but, so, but did I have to eat it to be Japanese or to <laughs> be healthy? No, right? I did not have to eat it to be healthy. And so foods, I think it's important. You focus on the nutritional intake, and it's not that everyone has to eat everything. Absolutely. Can so, be modified. Yes. So. All right, Marie says hi and thank you. <laughs> I have a question about um, defined behavior because that's our biggest problem. So um, every time that we need to do something or want to do something, his first re response will be no. And for example, getting dressed to get out the door, um, he would just kick us and scream and we'll be this meltdown and sometimes it can take. If we're really patient, we're not going to force him to get dressed, once it took me three hours to get out of the door. Um, and, well, there's so much we can take, and sometimes you have a schedule, and I gotta get him dressed, and that can be very um, painful um, for us, I think, because it's just, it's kind of an aggression to get him dressed that way. Um, so my question is how to deal with that. Well, one thing um, that I have found has helped with my son, he likes to choose his own outfits. So sometimes oh, yeah. giving them a little control um, could help. When you think about how much we direct our children all day long from the moment they wake up until the moment they go to bed, I mean, we're literally telling them when they need to wake <clears throat> up and when they need to go to bed and everything in between. So if you can incorporate a little choice in there, Maybe yeah. that could help. We did that. But and it didn't help. It, it, no, it backfired because then he takes hours choosing the oh, clothes and, and he tries like five outfits and it's just... Okay. It you could work. also try... Another thing I've done is try to make it into a game a little bit and set a timer and say, if you beat the timer, then you can have a reward. And this is where you would save, like, mm -hmm. like say if he likes jelly beans or something, you know, quick, uh, you know, you can have a bite of banana, you can have... But you would only give it to him after he gets stressed and that reward has to be placed up high, he doesn't get it for anything else. And okay. you know, you could write out the rules, how we talked about sometimes you need to actually see something. When you're speaking, did you ever see um, Charlie Brown and Snoopy? Yeah. The teacher, wah, 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 mm -hmm. wah, okay. That might be what we sound like to them. You know, they can't process it in the way that we expect them to. So if they have a picture, of, of himself getting dressed even. It doesn't have to be a picture off the internet. You could take a picture of him when he's getting dressed and show him what you're expecting. And then you show him the timer and you say, okay, I'm setting it, ready, set, go. And, and sometimes I'll race them. Mm -hmm. I'll tell my kids, let's see who can get dressed first, you or me, and then you, know, you get a prize. And it's, it's hard because if they want to be defiant, yeah. you know, it, it can turn into ours. And, and then it's a, a battle of the will <clears throat> and you want you really ideally want them to do it under your control. And so if that means that they're getting a reward, I think that's okay. You know, if you went to work every day and you didn't get a paycheck at the end of the week, would you continue going? Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. think of it like that for our children. If we keep asking them to do things, but we're not giving them any rewards to do that, they're going to stop doing it. So if we could give them those rewards to keep them going, it, it could be really helpful. And would you set a... a a limit for that because we, we kind of used that at a time because we had to go out of the door so we would say okay half an hour if in half an hour we're not ready then we are going to dress you and we would tell him that um, but I think that the problem is after we do that um, 
he will be the rest of the day really cranky and we're have, gonna have really hard um, behavioral problems. So, uh, I mean, I don't know how to, if, if that is okay, if that's something you well, would advise. I, I like the concept <coughs> that you're giving him a time. I think a half hour is too generous, personally. I think you should set the time limit for what you actually want him to get dressed in. And because I think he's having a lot of control mm -hmm. in the situation where it should be your control. Yeah. So I think, you know, maybe five minutes is a reasonable amount and, and you set that. And if you, you can't do it on your own in five minutes, then mommy has to help you. And you can let him know, I don't want to help you. I want, you're a big boy. I want you to do it. Mm -hmm. But I think a half hour really gives him a lot of time to dawdle and play around yeah. and, and escape the actual, he's escaping. You're asking him to do something and he's not He's not having to do it for a whole half hour. How old is he? He's, uh, he'll be four in August. So the other thing that's very important to know for uh, the concept of time is it's very abstract. Mm -hmm. And a four-year-old won't know what 30 minutes is, an hour, 10 minutes. They don't know what one minute yeah. is con conceptually. So I think it's really good if you're using a visual timer so they see what time is passing. Mm -hmm. Because if you'd say, if you're saying, you know, half hour right now, whatever, and half hour passes, they, they're like, no, it didn't. Right? So they, you have to make time more concrete. So visually, if they could see, or he could see the counting down, that would be helpful too. Uh, and is it only the transition to leave the house, or is it other no, transitions too? No, it's everything that we need to do. For example, getting in the car chair, or everything. And then we, when we actually get him in the car chair, when we park the car, he doesn't want to leave. So it's Every like, transition. if we have to do it, he would say no. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I just, much I know uh, a strategy I learned from behavioral <laughs> therapists before is doing visual schedule cards, so we, pictures of where <coughs> you're going yes, and what's happening. Yes, I do happening. that, drawings, uh -huh. uh, he responds well to that, and he's signing too. I, I don't think it's a communication problem because he's very skilled, he's not mm -hmm. very verbal, but he finds mm -hmm. his way to communicate mm -hmm. when he needs something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and rewards, they, uh, we try that, it, it, it works to a certain point, and then... When he shuts down, he just shuts down. But I think beyond like the verbal skills, so having the picture schedules lets a child, it makes the world more predictable. Uh -huh. but especially for a four-year-old, the world, again, beyond time, it's very abstract. Yeah. We're going to school may not trigger the image of going to school. Yeah. So if we show the picture of this is, where, this is the face we're going to see at school, yeah. That might help him with those making it more concrete. So I, I just, I really want to validate the um, just the picture you're painting about the reinforcement with the negative attention, that's not what my inquiry is, but we've seen a dramatic transformation as we've been aware of how we are the reinforcers. And um, it really resonated the mom who spoke about her daughter, and I really am that for my child. So um, just want to thank you for bringing that to all of us because um, it transformed our lives this year. So um, speaking of that, I am weary of being teacher. I am a teacher, I am a psychologist, and I'm not practicing because that's my role as a mom. And so when you said that, Jessica, um, it just made me wonder, like, this is, this is exhausting, we all know that, but um, to do it well is beyond anything that I've ever experienced. And I've worked with some of the hardest cases you can imagine. So. Um, I'm just curious what your recommendation is beyond self-care, because we all know that, that that's a priority, but how do, we, how do we balance that? How do we maintain that consistency and then try and find those moments where we just get to rest and like just be present with our child? Um, it feels really hard to, to be able to hold both. Everything. Yeah. I, I think it's important to focus on one behavior at a time. So don't come in thinking, well, he does X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to work on all of those behaviors all the time. You will burn out, and there's no way that you can do that. But if you pick one behavior that's important to you that you want to work on, you work on that behavior, and you kind of have to let the other things go, which I think is hard. But if you want to do it well, that's the best way mm -hmm. to just choose one thing. And, and I'm glad that you highlighted that again, because I think we often underestimate how much we are the rewards for our children. Mm -hmm. And they want our access to us and our attention. And 
It's, it's something that we think, oh, he must want this, he must want that. Sometimes all of those behaviors exist because they actually want to get to you and get your attention. So sometimes what they, um, in the, the behavioral world, what we call non-contingent reinforcement. So sometimes you just want to sit down and play with your child and give them all of that attention that they need without it being a reward. Mm -hmm. So if you fill up their gas tank in the morning, you know, maybe during the morning routine it won't be so bad if they've already had their, their hugs mm -hmm. and their time and their tickles and a quick story. So, you know, if you get up 20 minutes earlier and give them that time, maybe they'll be more apt to be cooperative and, and go along with your routine. And maybe it will still be hard, but I think it's important to just be mom sometimes mm -hmm. and not have your behavioral hat on or your teacher hat, and that's a good point. Um, and if you don't mind, I'd like to recommend something that Dean and I have done that really, um, it speaks to what you're describing, and it's not ABA focused, but um, it naturally addresses those behaviors as a whole. It's more a parenting approach, and we've gone through it at Seattle Children's. It's called The Incredible Years, and um, it was a, created with the intention of supporting kids with ODD and ADHD and their families, and now it's extended to all kids with differences, delays, special needs, and that's called special time. And part of that approach is that no matter what's going on, you spend 20 minutes with child-directed play and making that intentional. Um, we spend a lot of time with our kids, but that one-on-one -on -one time really made a huge difference and ignoring the behavior. We call it using our ignoring muscles. So I've heard you say that during yeah, the week, and I, um, I liked that. That's so just, I just would like to suggest that people take a look at that, too. So, all right, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Marie asks, uh, can the handout that Janet mentioned be made available online? Yes. Yes? Great. Um, I think we have to wrap it up time-wise, but we can talk um, yeah. okay. Oh, one more? Okay. Well, all right, Jen. Thank you both. Um, very important topics, especially for our daughter who's six. Um, besides JS, she has autism, overall global delays. She takes swimming lessons, and the swimming lessons are taught by occupational therapists and physical therapists. And one of the things that they said was when she swims, they feel she has retained reflexes. And so she'll start swimming in a circle. And um, she can swim, but she looks like she's suffering in the water. So I didn't know if you could speak at all to about the retained reflexes, because we'll have brought this up to, say, the neurologist, and he doesn't see that. But yet, in certain activities, you can see she'll get stuck in a movement pattern and not be able to get out of that unless you kind of manipulate her from behind? So, <laughs> this is a whole nother talk. Uh, <laughs> so I want to answer it quickly. Uh, retain reflexes, uh, it's, it, is a, it is a frame of reference that some people are considering that used to be used many, many, many years ago, and it's making a resurgence. But what I would look at in terms of retained reflexes there's not much research about it currently to use it effectively in therapy. But what I would emphasize in the therapy session is it sounds like what your child is doing is using what we would say um, asymmetrical or has different use of the sides of the body. And so the therapy needs to work on better use of both sides of the body, not just one side at a time, right? And so they need to work on the two sides of the body working well in sync with each other. And that's what I would focus on versus necessarily, uh, it, it kind of goes to what I was talking about, get to function faster versus some therapies will emphasize integrate the reflex. And that's not necessarily functional focused. I'd rather, in, in my practice, everyone has their own approaches. I'd rather fac, uh, pra focus on the functional output versus the reflex because reflex isn't necessarily going to get me to the function. That's the, sorry, quickest way I can say it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank Janet and Jessica again for coming and also answering questions together because that way we got 
Um, I know that it's so rare for all of us to get two members of our team talking to each other, so to even have two members of the behavioral team answering questions together, you're getting a little bit more of an overview. So thank you to both of you. Thank you.